Hey everybody, uh, I'm going to try something new today. So this is a presentation that I've given a number of times in the past uh, with students and just kind of introducing some of these ideas of leadership. Uh, but we're going to try it today and uh, hopefully this will be a good thing that we can load up uh, to our Blackboard page and then you'll be able to watch it and get the recordings and then be able to uh, analyze it for next Sunday. So let's give it a shot. Uh, so this one, uh, leadership, we're going to start thinking differently, hopefully differently about leadership and uh, kind of give you some fun stories, some fun little video clips, uh, just kind of prompt your thinking on this. So let's get going. I know that uh, my picture is down in the bottom corner. It's going to cover some of the text in a little bit, but that's OK. There, there's plenty of other stuff and, and, and you'll be fine. So leadership, it's all in their heads. Let's get started. OK, so the first thing we're going to do, we're going to have a little color quiz. All right, not super hard. Uh, this will be the first quiz of the semester. Here we go. Ready? So tell me what color you see when I click up this square here in just a second. OK, you ready? Here we go. Probably everybody would say blue. OK, and you would be right. Uh, all right, here's the second one. Just a little bit harder. Ooh. OK, some of you also said blue, but now you have to change your blue and you have to go back and change your answer on the first one. So where the second one, second one over here is more navy blue, I think most of us would then go back and have to say royal blue on this one. Third one, hmm, maybe more of a, a baby blue. Uh, yeah, probably baby blue, kind of kind of bordering maybe on turquoise a little bit. This one, I, I think uh, kind of like a purpley blue, uh, maybe like periwinkle. Uh, the next one is teal and then the last one is more kind of a slate blue more of a gray blue more of a green blue more of a purple blue uh, and then you've got these different shades so why i introduced this is that when that first one popped up the first thing that comes to all of our minds is that it's blue but then as the different squares are revealed we realize that that one word blue is not sufficient to describe the shades of these different boxes so while, yes, they all do have blue in them, they are all very different. And so this is kind of where we're going uh, with this presentation, but also this class, that leadership, that one word, is typically used to describe too many things, just like uh, the word blue. Blue is insufficient to describe all of these different shades. The word leadership, leader, it is, is used too broadly to mean too many things. So that's what we're going to pull apart this semester, and hopefully... Uh, by the time we're done with this, I've hopefully changed your thinking about, a little bit about all these concepts. All right, let's keep going. Uh, do a little uh, word image association. So the first thing that pops in your mind when you hear the word, employee. Okay, maybe you can see something, maybe an image if you're a visual person, an image popped into your head. But uh, certainly we all have kind of a prototype in our head of, of an employee. And we could sit down and we could draw out characteristics and describe uh, based on our past experience, if we bring in people from uh, different parts of the world who grew up in uh, different areas and different cultures, they probably have a little different prototype in their head. How about this? How about partner? Again, did an image pop into your head? And then if we were to go through and describe character characteristics of a partner, how that would be different from the characteristics of an employee? Boss. Hmm. Same questions. We could draw it out. We could list out characteristics. Uh, maybe you see something in your head. And then lastly, on this one, is leader. And so, again, the same same exact question. What, what image do you see in your head that immediately popped into mind uh, when you saw that word? And then what would, what would the characteristics of a prototypical leader be? All right, so we're setting the stage. Okay, here's the next one. This is, uh, I'm going to describe a little project. This is my first project in my PhD program. And it was particularly related to leadership and perceptions of leadership. Who, who is perceived to be more leader-like? And there would be a lot of research, as you can imagine, on personal characteristics. So, you know, the confidence in speaking, um, their intelligence, uh, just kind of their confidence and knowledge of the subject matter. And, and whether the people regard this person as an authority and someone that is worthy of following. And, and that's all true. But kind of my, my thought in doing this project at first was, well, before you know anything about the person's intelligence or their confidence or their background, you know what they look like. And so what is the role of physical attractiveness, appearance, uh, as it relates to perceptions of leadership and leadership ability? So again, first project in grad school, 
uh, went off and uh, got some help and uh, found a bunch of pictures from a yearbook and uh, male and female, the ones that are kind of hidden here behind the smiley faces uh, are females, obviously, but uh, I'd also uh, pre-tested and then ran the analysis with males as well. And so had a bunch of students uh, evaluate the attractiveness on a, on a Likert type scale. And then from that was able to statistically break them into three groups, high, medium, and low attractiveness, male and female, and was able to cross it with those, some of those other things. So uh, cross it with an uh, indicator of intelligence and cross it with an indicator of past leadership ability. And then was able to administer it to a very large group of students who evaluated it. And uh, this is what the results came out. Okay, so we see that uh, this rating on a one to seven scale of, of uh, perceived leadership ability uh, given their attractiveness, and it's holding everything else constant. So it's holding male and female constant, and it's holding intelligence constant as indicated by measures of intelligence, and uh, also holding the level of demonstrated leadership ability as demonstrated through student organizations, all constant. So with the only thing that varied, you can see that the low attractiveness people received the lowest ratings, the medium attractiveness people, which had already been you know, statistically broken out into a medium group, uh, from a, from a pretest, from a previous assessment, uh, received the medium ratings, and then the highest group received the highest ratings. So interesting, interesting. Now, if you look at this, it's only it only splits between a 4.2 and a 4.7. The overall variance explained uh, was not that great, but it was still statistically significant and kind of went right along with, with what the hypothesis uh, should be based on uh, research from other areas. So before anything is known about a person, we see them. And right then we start making decisions and assessments of how, how uh, likely that person is to be a good leader or not good leader. So with that, we needed some theory to explain it. And here's what I found. Back in psychology, there is a concept called implicit, well, this is more kind of in our area, implicit leadership theory and then cognitive categorization theory. And kind of the idea behind this is that as we grow up, as we experience things in life, we can't remember every detail of everything that we encounter. Now, there are some people who have that ability, but they're very rare. Uh, but for the vast majority of us, we can't remember every single detail. And so what we tend to do is we tend to remember, I like to think of kind of chunks of information. We'll make a file drawer in our head and we'll, we'll label that file drawer. And then based on our experiences, we'll throw information. And then later in life, when we're confronted with that problem or issue, what we do is we jump into our heads, find that drawer, open it up, take a look in there at the prototype, and then compare that prototype to what you're experiencing. And then that allows you to make decisions uh, in the present and into the future. So those word associations that I gave, you had a prototype for boss. Now, where did that come from? Did it come from your own past experiences? Probably. Uh, but it also comes from other places. Leader, the same way. The employee, the partner. Okay, those, those are file drawers in your head that you're able to jump into and assess, look inside, see what it looks like, and then compare it to the situations in which you find yourself. So let's look at this. Here, here's something. Now, this is, this is for fun. I'm, I'm really not going to uh, disrespect uh, what you're about to see, but for fun, but also kind of serious. So let's look at this. Look at the, the manager. Look at the boss. Look at the maybe the leader in this video. Good morning, George. How are you? I hope you're feeling fine. I got to stay and talk, but it's almost eight o'clock and I haven't got the time. See you later. Because we work real hard at the chocolate factory. We start at eight and we don't get lunch till three. I got to drive Okay, the boss is about to, to be introduced. Look at the workplace. Listen to the words. Okay, now look at Mr. Lund. Where would he well, fall on that attractiveness scale? In trouble. Your time card is a wreck. It's almost two past eight. I'll tell Nether that you're late and he'll take it from your jack. Yeah, okay, and if you hadn't picked up on it, this is this is horrible. We work real hard. So this is what little kids jokingly in a fun veggie tales world are learning. But look at look at what they're learning about work. You'll be just fine. With all this work you'll do, we've got no time for sympathy. <laughs> Sorry, so dog's here. We used to laugh and run. Now there's no time to play, cause we gotta work on it. And it isn't very fun. 
I'm Rack. I'm Chad. I'm Benny. We work here in the plant. We'd like to take a break. For goodness sake. But Mr. Nazar says, You can't! <laughs> we all need a vacation. Our schedule is severe. We're getting very tired, but stopping gets us fired. So we'll have to stay right here. Because we work real hard at the chocolate factory. We start at 8 and we don't get lunch till 3. We work the whole week through to make a buck or two. So we can send them home to our families. All right, that again, just for fun. That's that's VeggieTales. Uh, here, before leaving this slide, I'm jumping on the next one. Uh, this idea of cognitive categorization theory and relating it back to attractiveness and relating it back to perceptions of leadership. When we're confronted with someone, we jump into our brain, look into the drawer, the file drawer that we have filed away chunks of information from past experiences. We compare the current situation or person or what problem with the past, and then we make a judgment. And that judgment uh, will drive our behavior. So right here, influences behavior based on past experiences, those mental mo models and prototypes. And then only if uh, future or the present behavior then overrides that. So we, we, we see this person, we hear this person, and we think that they are a good, going to be a good leader. But then when we start working, we, we then uh, discover information that causes us to change the categorization. That's, that's how that works. And it can go the other way too. We may perceive this person as not being kind of one with leadership potential, but then when they start working, it changes. And then we shift uh, from one categorization, uh, one category to another category. So VeggieTales, again, I'm not going to uh, disrespect them too much. We, we loved it. When the kids were little, we watched these all the time. But that idea of Mr. Lunt, uh, work is awful. We hate it here, but you know we'll keep working. But it's some, someday we hope to be happy again. Where did that come from? Well, it, unfortunately, it came from, from our history. Let me click over here. So it came from kind of the, the model of, of, of how work was, how workers were organized and uh, organizations were put together through the Industrial Revolution. And uh, particularly in the United States, you know, up to 100 years ago, maybe a little over 100 years ago. Uh, so let me show you this. And this is uh, from a video clip. You, you can Google it on YouTube. Uh, Henry Ford, uh, Scientific Management. Uh, even going back to old Adam Smith and, and division of labor. Again, Adam Smith said we get these huge gains in productivity uh, through division of labor, uh, dexterity of the workmen, one person do the same thing over and over again, no process loss, there's no wasted time moving between workstations. And then the third one, um, there was the invention of machines. So as you see this, this can be clips from some of those uh, Henry Ford factories in particular, but some of the other ones as well. So that whole Veggie Tales, where did that come from? Well, unfortunately, it kind of came from our history. Soon assembly lines were up and running in Ford's factory. The lines became the key to mass now production, jobs, a so system that like would remain jobs. virtually unchanged for most of the century. A network of clanging conveyors was used to deliver parts to an exact point on the line. The workers became an integral part of the great machine, and management set the pace. Without discussion or negotiation, for unions were forbidden. The men faced new pressure as the final assembly line beat out the rhythm for the whole factory. There was no way they could stop or slow it down. Few stood the pace and din for long. Men tried it for a few weeks, then quit. By the mid-1920s, Ford had built the largest factory in the world. At the River Rouge plant, coal, iron, sand, and rubber were delivered at one end, and 2,500 Model Ts a day streamed out the other. Up to 80,000 men worked there. 
It was a game for which Ford made the rules simple but strict. High pay for hard work. Ford's private security force, the Plant Protection Service, kept discipline. Anyone who recruited for the unions was fired. Company spies kept a lookout for those considered to be troublemakers. All right, that is our history. That is that is for real. Uh, again, the, through the Industrial Revolution from Adam Smith, all the way up through really the Hawthorne studies, the Western Electric studies. Uh, for the most part, management theory was economic theory and it was organization theory. And then with the Hawthorne studies, which we'll get into more, uh, things changed. So with this, you know, kind of looking back at that model, uh, the machine metaphor, and, and we can get into this more, especially with the org behavior class uh, in, in second, uh, second part of the semester. But the, the workers were viewed as machine parts, that there's this big machine and the, and the workers are just parts. And the workers as machine parts don't really have the, uh, the understanding to uh, question or ask, but the managers are the ones who decide everything and the workers are getting paid to be the machine parts and to carry out their work. Efficiency, efficiency, efficiency is what it was all about. And the idea that uh, Douglas McGregor stuff, uh, theory X, theory Y, it was that theory Y attitude for the most part uh, that, that governed uh, how to control and uh, organize workers. So real quick, let's, let's jump over here and uh, look at this. Now this is an attitude, uh, Douglas McGregor, uh, an attitude, my kind of Patterson's definition, it's an evaluative belief about something in particular. Uh, you can have a attitude about the, the chair you're sitting in. You can have an attitude about the weather. You can have an attitude about the car you drive. You can have an attitude about anything. Uh, but those attitudes then drive, we talk about three different dimensions of an attitude, A, B, C, affective or the emotions, B, uh, the behavioral dimension is what you do about it, and then the C is the cognition or what you think. So attitudes bring with them uh, a think, a do, and a feel, think, feel, do. And then from those, that, that then drives your behavior. So with attitudes in particular, as related by uh, Douglas McGregor when he talked about it, he talked about attitudes about workers. So what is your attitude about the people you work with? Theory X is that people are lazy and unmotivated, and the only way to get them to do stuff is to threaten and coerce and kick them in the pants. And they need to be watched over and they need to be pushed and prodded to get work done. They want to do as little as possible. And so your job is to speed them up and get it done. That's the theory X attitude. So if that is your attitude about people, it's always going to reflect back on how you interact with people and encourage them, encourage them to get stuff done. Kind of the counter to that is the theory Y attitude. And theory Y is that people are inherently good. And if given the opportunity to do good, they will do good. And so you want to put them into an environment uh, where they can exceed and grow and, and do great things. So two different attitudes. Uh, I like to kind of think our, our house in Arkansas had a big old uh, oak tree out in the backyard that would just drop millions of pecans every year, uh, not pecans, millions of uh, acorns every year. And, and they were kind of a pain. They're almost like ball bearings going down our backyard, or down the hill. Uh, theory X attitude is those things are just, uh, they're a pain and they need to be, they need to be gotten rid of and they just kind of ruin life. And so if that were my attitude about that, I would sweep them up and I would get rid of them uh, as soon as I could. Theory Y attitude would be more like in each one of those little acorns, I see the potential for another great oak tree that could do wonderful things and provide shade and provide more acorns and places for birds and, and provide you know oxygen. So if I had a view of acorns that way, then I would want to take those acorns and nurture them and develop them and put them into an environment where they can grow and plant them and let, they can, let them become all that they can be. So kind of a similar, similar uh, metaphor analogy uh, between kind of the workers, theory X and theory Y. Now here, before we leave this, and we'll come back to it later, just because uh, there are times, you know, as a parent, as a teacher, there are times when I need to get onto my people. And when I get onto the people, I may be uh, using coercive methods or we're not the, the friendliest, most chatty, uh, best relationship at that moment, but that doesn't mean I'm theory X. It just means that in to be theory Y, to get them to grow and develop and become all they can be. Sometimes, I don't wanna say I'm gonna have to be mean, but somehow, <laughs> sometimes we may have interactions that are gonna not be the most pleasant uh, for, for both parties. So just kind of remember that theory Y, theory X. Okay, with that, let's jump over here. So this is from a book and it's kind of hidden. It's called Leading Self-Directed Work Teams by Kimball Fisher. 
and it's a book that I've used in my team's classes in the past. But in this book, he kind of draws upon uh, those ideas of theory X, theory Y, and he talks about the control paradigm, and then it's counter is the commitment paradigm. And I'm gonna show you that on the next screen. But the control paradigm is really kind of theory X. It's the old industrial uh, revolution model. It's the, you know, people are machine parts. You just get them to do stuff kind of however you need to, uh, you pay them. And then they really don't have any more involvement other than paying and getting the work done. So this is the control paradigm. And you can kind of read through this. Um, it's counter is the commitment paradigm, and this is different. So instead of controlling them, you get them to buy into the idea, get them committed to what it is that you're working for and that you're doing. And then once that's done, once they're committed, uh, then they're more willing to step up and become self-motivated and active on their own. So these, these are these two wonderful uh, kind of counter thoughts uh, that Kimball Fisher gave, the control paradigm, where kind of the goal is to control the people and, and move them and manipulate them to where you need them versus the commitment paradigm. You get them to buy into the idea. And then once they're bought in, you all go together toward this. All right. Uh, so also Kimball Fisher in talking about all these same ideas, theory X, theory Y, control, commitment. He gave an example. I think he grew up. I'd have to go back and read. I think he grew up in the American West where uh, uh, livestock and dogs to help uh, round up those uh, sheep or whatever they may be uh, were kind of his childhood, maybe visiting grandparents or something, but he would see this on farms. But he also reported going to the Holy Land. And in the Holy Land, again, kind of going back and looking at the Bible, uh, there, there are a lot of metaphors and stories of shepherds. And so shepherds versus sheep herder. Okay. And, and he noticed when he was in the Holy Land, kind of with his own, again, that drawer in his head from his past experiences, uh, he noticed a shepherd uh, with a large group of sheep. And at a magic time, the shepherd got up and started to walk away and the sheep followed the shepherd. And he realized how different that was from what he had seen back home as a kid, where you had to have the dogs go out and round up the sheep and bring them in. And that I think that was kind of an important idea in his uh kind of framework for outlining his book, but he talked about a sheep herder whose goal is to move the sheep, barking and heel nipping. Uh, the sheep is dependent upon the sheep, the sheep herder uh, behind the flock. The work is about the flock. It's about directing. That shepherd, the one who just got up and then started to move to a better place for the sheep, the sheep followed. And so with that, the shepherd is working on developing now, we're talking about sheep, but we're also kind of talking about a metaphor relating to people as well. So developing, looking at the focus is on the surroundings more so than just the flock. The location is out in front and the, and the sheep would follow, the people follow. The goal is to create shepherds. The methodology is clearing the path. Uh, the result is self, uh, self reliance on them, on themselves. Okay. So these ideas, I'm going to show you another little video, again, another something that we used to watch when the kids were little. Uh, if you remember from Babe, the movie Babe, uh, look at this and you're gonna see a lot of things. Look at theory X, look at theory Y, look at control, look at commitment, uh, look at the, literally, look at the, the sheep herder versus a shepherd. It's all in here. But you're treating them like equals. They're sheep, they're inferior. Oh, no, they're not. Of course they are. We are their masters, babe. Let them doubt it for a second there and they'll is. walk all over you. Fly! Get that pig out of there! Make them feel inferior. Abuse them. Insult them. Fly! They'll laugh at me. And bite them. Be ruthless. Whatever it takes, bend them to your will. Enough! Go on. Go. Move along there, you... You, uh... Big buttheads! <laughs> need for all this wolf nonsense, young'un. All a nice little pig like you need do is ask.
Thanks very much. It was very kind of a pleasure. What a nice little pig. All right. How did you do it? I asked them and they did it. I just asked them nicely. Now, we don't ask sheep, dear. We tell them what to do. But I did, Mom. They were really friendly. Okay, wonderful clip. This is kind of one of my favorite clips from anything that I do. This, uh, in, in one little clip, uh, it, it shows the, kind of that idea that shift from the command uh, mentality, the command paradigm, to the uh, commitment. It shows the shifting from theory X to theory Y. Uh, the Hawthorne studies, the total quality management, and how kind of the core ideas behind that, self-directed work teams, they're all based in these same ideas. And that idea of the sheep, sheep herder, where you tell them what to do, versus the shepherd, they follow you, they buy into this idea. So this, this is what we're gonna be playing with. Uh, the ideas of what leadership is, uh, what leaders are, and how they're different from bosses, so again, in your in your mind, a, a boss uh, should be kind of a have kind of a negative connotation to boss the people around. That's more like the dogs, where uh, a leader type would be the one who's out in front. Uh, so I think the lesson from this one is uh, don't be a dog, be a pig. Uh, in 1990, the oh here's was let's watch this. To get some this is Howard Schultz. We had about 50 stores. Someone who understands. We still that. were not making money, and I think we all realized at the time that we were not in the coffee business serving people, but we were in the people business serving coffee. That if we wanted to exceed the expectations of the customer, we had to first exceed the expectations of our people. I think very strongly that long-term value for Starbucks shareholders was then and is now directly linked to the value we create for our people. But I'm also here to tell you that I feel strongly that long-term value for your shareholders cannot be achieved in an enduring, sustainable way unless the management of the company is completely and comprehensively committed to creating long-term value for the employees. And the two are directly linked together. And any company, any management team that turns its back on its people and doesn't share the success of the company with the people who do the work are not going to finish the race. The people are going to leave. A fracturing of trust and confidence is going to be created culturally, and the business will not succeed long term. The most important discipline inside the organization is not coffee buying, real estate acquisition, IT, marketing, merchandising. It's none of that. It is absolutely the human resource function and discipline and the opportunity to capitalize and leverage on human capital. And it means more than ever cracking the code on how do we attract, retain, inspire, and create opportunities for the future leaders of our business. And more than ever before, what we're really trying to do is connect with our people. Okay, this is very much that commitment paradigm. It's very much a theory why model. It's very much a leadership model as opposed to being a boss. Uh, this is what we'll play with. So here, in case you missed it, this is what he said. I had to go back and watch this probably 10 times to be able to get these words all right. The most important discipline inside the organization is the human resource function and the discipline and the opportunity to capitalize and leverage on human capital. It means tapping into the people and developing leaders within the company. It's a leadership thing. It's a human relations thing. Also, long-term value for the shareholders are not gonna be developed or sustained unless the organization is committed wholeheartedly to its people. Uh, and then lastly, in order to get this, you're gonna to have to exceed the expectations of your people that they feel like they're valued and in a valuable organization. That's when it's gonna come back to you. And then lastly, before we wrap all this up, let's do one more little word association. Okay, what is what image pops to your mind when you hear the word telephone? We've probably got something in our mind. Does it look like that? No, probably looks more like this. Okay, but realize that at one point, this was state of the art. This was revolutionary and groundbreaking. But in the previous, in the next hundred years, we have developed 
and we have developed new technology and new things that we can do with these uh, phones. Uh, the same idea, the same metaphor goes with management thinking. What made sense and was state of the art and revolutionary 100 years ago, I think we can all see has been replaced by something far better. And so through this course and through uh, even the course next semester and through your MBA and really just kind of life and your professional experiences, I think you will hopefully see that and appreciate and respect it, that those old mental models that maybe we grew up with um, have been replaced. And through education and understanding, experimentation, being around good people, we can see that there are better ways to do it. So this is where we're going to play with. I hope this worked all right. Uh, I had some kids and dogs walking around in the background, but uh, that's kind of my life. So anyways, with that, uh, good luck on this. And uh, we will, I'll, ask, I'll post some uh, review questions for you to think about this and then get these things loaded up at the end of the week. That's it. Thanks a lot.